Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I had a friend tell me the other day, he said, uh, I saw God walking in Texas, and I asked him what he was doing. And God said, well, I decided to work from home. <laughs> and so I said, given the daytime highs we're having, are you sure he wasn't just doing an inspection tour of hell? But <laughs> If you need a, a definition for hell, my working definition for years has been August in Houston. So that's <laughs> Welcome everybody. We are so glad to have you here. And we, are there any announcements who did not make the newsletter or that we would like to repeat right now? Okay. The peace of Christ be with you. Pass that peace by waving. given us and drawn us close, reconciling us through Jesus Christ, who has lavished upon us the fullness of the Holy Spirit. With glad and grateful hearts, praise the Lord. Let's pray together the opening prayer. Lord Jesus, Son of God, your blessings know no boundaries. Strengthen us to trust in your mercy. Reach out for your healing and receive your reconciliation. Amen. confession. Have mercy on us, Lord Jesus. We are tormented. Our lives are disrupted by the devil and by our own devilish desires. We are dismayed at your presence, anguished by our own failures. We cannot take back what we have said or undo what we have done or atone for the agony we have caused. We are haunted by the past, plagued by the present, and fearful of the future. We shrink away from your gaze as strangers outside your circle of blessing. Yet the faith you have planted in us reaches out for your favor, returns to your presence, and hungers for your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hear now our silent confession. Our God kisses us with kindness, forgiving our sins, preserving our lives and restoring our souls through the abundant provision of our Lord Jesus Christ. Receive now that for which faith has hungered. We are forgiven and healed in the name of Jesus the Christ. Joseph being one of several brothers, and it talks about 
the, the, the Bible tells us that he was the favored son. He had a, a coat of many colors that the Bible talks about. And, and as a result of the favor that he got from his father, his brothers were kind of jealous of him and didn't really like him very much. And it talks about a time when they were out in the desert and his brothers who just kind of had enough of it. And they plotted to, to, to kill him. They were going to kill him and throw him in a pit. And they were going to smear blood from a lamb on his, on his coat. And take it back and tell their father that, that, that the wild animals had got him. But instead, they ended up selling him as a slave. And over the next several years, he lived as a slave. He lived in, in the house of, of one of, of uh, Pharaoh's uh, generals. He got accused of something he didn't do. He ended up in, in prison. He got to make friends with some people in the prison and they told the, the Pharaoh about the, his ability to, to uh, interpret dreams. And he ended up being the right hand man. Okay? The second person in charge of, of this land. And a time came when his father, there was a famine, and his father and sent the brothers to see if they could get some help. Do you think maybe he thought about taking revenge on his brothers? Think about it. You, 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 you lived this life away from your family, you were sold into slavery, you were put into prison, you were accused of stuff you didn't do. You think there might be a little bit of, of anger there? Sure. The Bible tells us, though, that instead of being angry, he took compassion. He sent the brothers back home and, and brought the father. And, and mind you, the, the brothers didn't realize who he was. It had been so long since they'd seen him, they didn't realize that this was the brother that they'd sold. So I want to try something here. You guys can either lick or take a bite of that. It's a lemon, by the way. <laughs> Go ahead, real quick. Just, just take a little lick of it or take a bite of it. Nice face. Can you do it? Not yet? What it tastes like? What, what's it taste like? It tastes like sour. Soury, yeah. Soury, bitter, yeah. You think maybe if, <laughs> if, if we have anger in our lives and we want to take revenge on somebody in our lives, that's what we have in our lives. We have that sourness. We have that bitterness. Now, try this one. Ooh, there's sugar in it. Okay, what's that one taste like? It's still a lemon, but it's got some sugar on it. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna lick that one clean, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of sweet, right? So now we've got that sweetness, and that's how we feel when we forgive people. We're not carrying around that burden of being angry and having that bitterness in our lives. We've got that sweetness in our lives that we can carry around and be happy. That's the way God wants us to be. God doesn't want us to carry around bitterness and anger towards other people. He doesn't want us to be plotting our revenge against people. He wants us to forgive people, just like we've been forgiven. We've all, everybody in this room, has done something that has angered God. And he sent Jesus to forgive us for what we have done. And that's what he expects us to do as well. Will you pray with me now? Dear God, Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this day. And we thank you for being able, and we thank you for being able to allow forgiveness to, allow forgiveness to those who have done wrong to us. To those who have done wrong to us. Amen. 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 All right, you guys have a good day and we'll see you.
for illumination, let's pray together. Merciful Savior, your suffering has saved our lives, secured our future, and restored us to relationship with God. Remove the shame and fear that causes us to cower in your presence. By the power of your Spirit, open our eyes and hearts to your word of love, mercy, healing, and blessing. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Most of you hear Janice sing, I'm sure you have warm feelings. But since she and I are both from Syracuse, New York, I just have sub freezing. <laughs> I want to give some background before reading this morning's text. When we hear the name David, we frequently think of Goliath. And I just happen to know a limerick about Goliath. From head to toe, armored for war, the giant came out with a roar. But with ease, the young shepherd lad mortally peppered him. Who did your armor, Dior? Our text today comes from the one David story we'd like to forget. It shows him at his worst. One day, David is taking a walk on the palace roof, looks down and sees a beautiful woman taking a bath. Her name is Bathsheba. The word bath doesn't refer to her love of soaking in hot tubs. Bath in Hebrew means daughter of, like Ben is son of. And so Bathsheba uh, is a translation of an Arabic tribe. Uh, so she's the daughter of the tribe of Shua. Unfortunately for David, this Arabian princess is not only the daughter of the friendly tribe of Shua, but she's also the wife of a Hittite named Uriah. Uriah is an extremely loyal soldier in David's army, currently serving on the front line. David takes a second look at Bathsheba, and the rest, as they say, is history. He sends his messengers to bring her to him, and sometime later, she sends him a message, I'm pregnant. David's mind goes into high gear. In the past, his mind has served him well. It has brought his country unprecedented prosperity, and all this prosperity makes David think he's invulnerable. So the first thing David tries 
is a cover-up. If he can get Uriah to believe the child is his, no problemo. But there is a problem. Uriah has been at the front line a long time. David quickly orders him home for a little R&R and tells Uriah to go see his wife. If these two spend a romantic weekend together, then David's off the hook. But Uriah refuses. He's taken a vow of celibacy until the Lord gives Israel victory. Exasperated by Uriah's loyalty, David writes a letter to Joab, his army commander, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. So Uriah, the loyal soldier, is killed indirectly by the man to whom he has devoted his life. I, I can't help myself. I'm thinking of another limerick. But this one is about Uriah, and it comes with a footnote. You have to know a classic Latin phrase from the time of the Roman Empire, dulce et decorum, it is sweet and fitting, pro patria mori, to die for your country. A sentiment, of course, expressed only by those who haven't. The limerick goes like this. The sight of Bathsheba's glory moved David to thoughts amatory. He settled the fate of Uriah, her mate, with a dose of pro patria mori. So with Uriah out of the way, David marries Bathsheba, and she bears him a son. And this brings us to this morning's text. 2 Samuel chapter 11 uh, through 12, 15. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich, the other very poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb. He brought it up, it grew with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. But he took... Uh, now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock to prepare for the wayfarer, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he has done this, because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I rescued you from the land of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added so much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and taken his wife to, to be your wife. You have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house. 
for you have despised me. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin, and you shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. Hardly has David and Bathsheba's son been born when the prophet comes knocking at the door. He has a message from God, and the way he delivers it is pure genius. He starts with a story. Oh, it would have been so easy to condemn David to his face, just hit him with the facts. But Nathan has a different task. His job is not to vent his anger at an immoral king. More profoundly than condemning David, Nathan wants to change him, to get him to see what he's done, to revive his conscience. If David can see this, if he can pronounce judgment on himself, the impact on David and the country will be profound. So Nathan approaches David not to destroy him, but to bring him back to God. So Nathan tells a story. People drop their defenses while listening to a good story about someone else. When words aren't aimed directly at us, we listen better. We're free from defending ourselves and free to identify with different characters in the story. When I was teaching North American literature in the, was at a Catholic university in the Guatemala, I would encourage my students to relate different characters in the story to different parts of themselves. So as we listen to today's story, let us listen for what the Word of God is saying about the Nathan part of us, the King David part of us, and the Bathsheba part of us. Unfortunately, it's difficult to relate to our Bathsheba part because the Bible reflects a very male-oriented society so with few exceptions, we have no Bible stories told from a woman's point of view. Thus in today's text, Bathsheba's actions, her feelings, motivations are a complete mystery. So Nathan tells a story about a rich man with many flocks who steals the lamb of a poor man. David is outraged pronounces a death sentence, and then Nathan tells him, you're the man. And David's heart is broken. Not because Nathan has condemned him, but because David has condemned himself. He's broken three commandments. Thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. With great remorse, David confesses his guilt and even condemns himself to death. But God has other plans. The Lord says, Nathan has put away your sin. You shall not die. This is good news. But the bad news is his child will die. Because in conceiving him, David has utterly scorned the Lord. Now folks, this is the hardest part of the story for me. That a child should die for his father's sin I cannot explain that. But there's an ancient understanding that while God has given us total freedom to decide how to live, God has also set boundaries on our freedom. So there are moral limits that we trespass at our own peril. Like those ancient European maps of the world about a hundred miles off the coast of Europe 
there were little drawings of dragons and the maps warned, beyond here lie dragons. We are free to go beyond God's limits. People do it every day. But there are consequences. And consequences are different than punishments. Consequences can be very punishing. But there is a difference. I simply don't believe that God sits at our moral boundaries ready to zap trespassers with a lightning bolt or to kill a sickly child. That wouldn't be freedom. That would be a booby trap. Jesus puts this issue to rest in Luke 13 when he tells the story of the Tower of Siloam that fell over and killed 18 people. And Jesus asks his listeners, were those people any more sinful than any others? Instead, I believe that God in all compassion has told us the way the world really works. In the stories of the Bible, God lets us know that we not only live in a physical world, but a moral world as well. Our moral and immoral actions have consequences, just as our physical ones do. Drop a stone out a window, it falls to the ground. Conceive a child, pawn it off on another man, make its mother a widow, the child suffers. Because this is the will of God? I can't say. All I know is that's the way it is. And consequences are different than punishments. Back in the 1970s, I went through a messy divorce. Is, is there any other kind, right? Uh, but my ex and I got one thing right. We agreed never to use our kids in any kind of emotional ping pong game. And we would always speak positively about each other. Yet for all our efforts, our kids were still scarred in many ways from that breakup. Divorce, like all our choices, carries consequences that neither we nor our children can escape. We live interconnected lives as the effects of our actions reverberate throughout the world. When we exercise our free will in life-giving ways, the earth quakes beneath our feet. When we make bad choices, the earth quakes in a different way. There are realities governing our life that we cannot break without discovering sooner or later the consequences. In maritime law, a ship is liable for damage caused by its wake. Likewise, we are answerable to God for the damage done by our wake. And when we discover these consequences, God does not turn on us. God sends prophets to convict us, to tell us stories that show us who we really are. And if we're lucky enough to feel our hearts split in two, then we may find that even the death sentences we have pronounced on ourselves are lifted. Because the recognition of sin is the beginning of the end of sin. The moment we recognize that we're lost, God reaches out and brings us home. David is forgiven by God, but David's life is never the same. Like Pharaoh of old, David buries his firstborn, but he can't bury the consequences of the sin. Verse 10 promises, the sword shall never leave your house. And verse 11, I will raise up trouble against you in your own house. And both of these promises uh, are in fact poetic descriptions of a bitter harvest that David, not God, but David has planted. If you read on through the historical books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, David's future heartaches from competing wives and scheming children 
are all consequences of today's text. David has to live with these consequences, but he does live. He and Bathsheba have a second son whom they name Replacement. Now, how would you like to be the second kid in your family? The oldest one has died, and they name you Replacement. Well, Replacement uh, in Hebrew, the Hebrew word is Solomon. And eventually, little Replacement, that is little Solomon, will grow up and rule Israel for 40 years. The lineage of a Jewish king and an Arab woman will produce many important people, including a great, great, ever so great grandson named Jesus, who no doubt knew today's story very well. Well, we've reached the most important part of any sermon, the point where you, the listener, draws some conclusions. If we treat these Bible stories strictly as interesting historical data, that's where they'll stay. But in order for them to become the Word of God in our life, we have to connect the dots. What is this Word of God delivered by Nathan to David saying to each one of us. Are we still living with the consequences of a bad decision? Is one of the consequences of this bad decision uh, sitting next to you? No, don't answer that. <laughs> it is time for us, or is it time for us, to make some changes in our life? to make restitution, to say, I'm sorry, or to say to someone long dead who once hurt us greatly, rest in peace, because I sure intend to. So what do you think? Was David a good person or a bad person? Maybe it's time to stop thinking about ourselves as good or bad people and start focusing on the good and bad choices that we have made. If we insist on thinking of David as a good person, as a hero, I hope it is not because of the David and Goliath story. I hope it's because of one moment in today's text, the moment after David hears Nathan say, you're the man. Remember David for the next moment in our story when he repents and hears God say, you're the man I love. Amen. Please stand if you're able, and we will recite together uh, the Declaration of Faith. God and the Holy Spirit fulfills the work of reconciliation among us. The Holy Spirit creates and renews the church as the community in which people are reconciled to God and to one another. He enables them to receive forgiveness as they forgive one another, and to enjoy the peace of God as they make peace among themselves. In spite of their sin, he gives them power to become representatives of Jesus Christ and his gospel of reconciliation to all people.
There is a third verse to that song. Jesus loves me when I'm good, when I do the things I should. Jesus loves me when I'm bad, even though it makes him sad. That one didn't make it him. <laughs> <laughs> then let us pray using the prayer in the insert. Let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, Lord, help us. God of mercy and healing, you are Lord of all, embracing the estranged, blessing the banished, reconciling the rejected. We cry out to you now, confident that your provision is abundantly more than enough to preserve the church redeem the world, and deliver the tormented. Lord, help us. For your people, the house of Israel, and the households of faith near and far, Lord, help us. That the church may replicate your reconciliation, model your mercy, and herald your healing for all. Lord, help us. For unity and harmony to flow freely among your creatures and throughout your creation, Lord, help us. For reconciliation and new beginnings among estranged families, races, nations, and peoples, Lord, help us. For healing for those who are tormented, rejected, marginalized, fearful, forgotten, cast off, Lord, help us. For those unnamed among us who are struggling silently in our presence, Lord, help us. We stand in your circle of favor embraced by you, healed by you, secured by you, grateful for your loving care. Amen. Lord God, hear us now as we pray, as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We were talking a moment ago about hospice, and now our prayer is all about reconciliation. I remember two brothers. Uh, the details were nasty, but the details went back 30 years. And these two guys had not spoken to each other in 30 years. Uh, this was in Del Rio. And finally, one of them went into hospice up on uh, Fredericksburg Road in the, near the hospitals. And they reconciled uh, the, day, the day before the one brother died. Don't, uh, don't do that to yourself and don't do that to a relative. If there's somebody, if there's somebody, it doesn't mean you have to become their best friend, but if there's anything acting as a barrier, it, it, the Confession of 67 says that we're alienated three different ways. We're alienated from God, we're alienated from each other, and we're alienated from our true self. And so if we start to reach out in any of those dimensions, all of those dimensions are, are impacted. So do it today. Let us receive this morning's offering.
us pray. Gracious Lord, you have given us more mercy than we can imagine and more blessings than we deserve. Receive now these gifts as tokens of our gratitude to you, that your mercy may be multiplied and your blessings abound to embrace all those in need. Amen. And now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide upon each of us and upon those whom we love this day and forevermore. Amen.